this section, I'm going to be talking about the potassium imbalances, um, specifically looking at the clinical manifestations of each, the nursing diagnosis, and the nursing implementation. Okay. The evaluation part of the nursing process, I'm not really talking about, but let's let's we will talk about it in class. So when we're evaluating, we're evaluating to see whether our interventions are working for this patient or whatever the physician has ordered is working. So when we talk about potassium imbalances, I'm talking about hyperkalemia, which means high potassium level. Anytime you see the word hyper, it means high or elevated. And then with hyperkalemia, this means greater than 5.0 milliequivalents per liter. And then hypokalemia is less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. So with hyperkalemia, the clinical manifestations that we're going to see is fatigue and irritability, muscle weakness and cramps. And if you look over to hypokalemia, we're seeing very similar manifestations. Difference here is going to, you're going to see loss of muscle tone with hyperkalemia and then soft, flabby muscles with hypokalemia. You're going to see paresthesias and decreased reflexes with both. With hyperkalemia, you're going to see abdominal cramping, diarrhea and vomiting versus with hypokalemia you're going to see constipation, nausea, and paralytic ileus. Paralytic ileus means basically that the that the bowel is paralyzed. So you'll have um, reduced bowel sounds or hypoactive bowel sounds. With hyperkalemia you may have con you may see confusion, irregular pulses, tetany, which tetany is a lot of times is, is irregular sporadic movements, um, cardi and cardiac dysrhythmias. And with hypokalemia, you're going to see shallow respirations, weak irregular pulses, and hyperglycemia. And you're going to see a, a, a connection with this and one of the, and some of the complications of diabetes. Now, with cardiac dysrhythmias, you'll hear a lot that you will with that, that these patients are on cardiac monitors. With the cardiac dysrhythmias, without going beyond where what you should know right now, you'll see tall peak T waves. Okay. And these can be dangerous to our patients. They can lead to ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest if we do not um, treat them appropriately. So the nursing diagnosis that you're going to see most often for hyperkalemia is risk for electrolyte imbalance. And this is related to excessive retention or cellular release of potassium. So excessive retention meaning that it's not coming out. A lot of times our potassium, we lose it in our urine and in our bowel when we have a bowel movement. Okay, so we're holding on to that potassium. Cellular release of potassium occurs from trauma, um, burns, things like that, because like I said earlier, potassium is in the intracellular fluid. So if you have a crushing injury or a burn, then that potassium can leak out into the vascular system and cause hyperkalemia. Risk for activity intolerance related to the muscle weakness. Remember, with, but with, with hyperkalemia, we've got the flabbiness um, of the muscles. And then potential risk for injury related to muscle weakness and seizures. You're, hopefully you're starting to beginning to see a pattern with electrolyte imbalances with the nursing diagnosis. A lot of them are very similar. With, and potential complications that we can see are dysrhythmias, which a lot of times elevated T waves, as I said before, and extra PVCs or premature ventricular contractions. And we're going to see this with hyperkalemia most often, but we can also see it sometimes with hypo as well and some of our other electrolyte imbalances. Nursing implementation for hyperkalemia. So we want to eliminate potassium intake if we can or reduce potassium intake. So knowing what are some of the high potassium foods that we're going to see, um, that like bananas and things like that. So you might go back to your nutrition book and look at those things that, um, that are full of potassium. A lot of our salt substitutes have potassium in it. And so we would eliminate potassium intake orally as well as intravenously. We want to increase potassium elimination. So as you're going through pharmacology and you're learning what loop and thiazide diuretics are, these are these are diuretics that do not hold on to potassium. You're going to learn about another type of a diuretic called potassium sparing. All right. So if we want to get rid of potassium, we will give loop or thiazide diuretics. Um, dialysis may be something that is in, in emergent situations, especially if a patient has poor kidney function, a lot of times you will see when individuals have um, poor kidney function that this will this will wreak havoc on electrolytes. The patient cannot eliminate the electrolytes and the waste products. The other thing that you may see is patrimir or veltasa and sodium poly polyesterine sulfonate or kx -late. And I've used KX Lake quite often. I've used it in the form of orally where they swallow it. And I've also used it in the form of KX Lake enemas where you actually insert it up into the rectum 
an inflate a balloon so it stays up in there up in there and the potassium binds to the k exalate and reduces the potassium level okay and at times we the the physicians will order depending on what's happening where with the the patient we need to be able to force the potassium from the extracellular fluids into the intracellular fluids. So how they'll do this is they will give a patient insulin and bicarb sometimes, sodium bicarb, and that will, the insulin will carry that into the cells and, and, and it somehow opens up the gate so that the potassium can go back in. Um, they may also use beta adrenergic agonists such as nebulized albuterol as well. Um, IV calcium chloride or calcium gluconate also may be used, and what they use that for is to help to reverse the membrane potential. And this is what they, they use this in order to help protect the patient from continuous, from cardiac dysrhythmias. Patients that have high potassium levels will be on a cardiac monitor, okay, because they, again, they can have life threatening dysrhythmias that can ultimately lead to their death. Moving along to hypokalemia, we kind of we gave the signs and symptoms back on this slide right here. The fatigue, the muscle weakness, the soft flabby. I think I had hypo and hyper reversed earlier. Um, and so what we're going to see here is we're going to see that they have a risk for electrolyte imbalance related to excess potassium loss. Okay, and then they have a risk for activity intolerance again related to that muscle weakness, risk for injury from muscle weakness. And then the hyporeflexia, which is their reflexes, are, their reflexes different, are not as active as they should be. And then our potential complications related to the potential for dysrhythmias with our hypokalemia. Our nursing implementation for hypokalemia is they're going to do oral and or IV potassium chloride or KCL supplements. Okay, And in your book, it has a lot of different safety alerts on KCL and how to give it. When you get more into IV therapy and looking up medications, you're going to learn that we don't give IV potassium more than 10 milliequivalents per hour unless a patient's in critical care. When we give IV potassium, there's a lot of considerations. We would never give that IV push. Um, it's always through an, an, um, a, an IV writer or actually in a full bag of fluids. Patients will be on continuous EKG monitoring as well because, again, with this, we can have lots of dysrhythmias. And then they're, they're going to monitor their serum, serum potassium levels quite often and then looking at their urinary output as well. And then patient and caregiver teaching. And there's another box in, in your book, Box 16.6, which talks about making sure you instruct um, patients and family on, on uh, reporting the signs of hypokalemia, having the potassium levels checked regularly, make sure to include foods that are high in potassium, um, alcohol in moderation, and then avoid licorice and follow medication instructions as ordered by the physician. This concludes my talk on potassium, hyper and hypokalemia.